Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second day of online training program about research trends in additive manufacturing technologies program conducted by Prayojaka Technologies in collaboration with National Center for Additive Manufacturing. I am Mansa, currently working under the guidance of Dr. Madhukar Sir at Prayojaka Technologies. I would like to welcome our guest speakers and facilitators who have generously agreed to share their expertise with us. The topic of first session is laser additive manufacturing and its application, for which we are honored to have Dr. Gopinath Muvala sir with us today to share their insights and knowledge with us. Dr. Gopinath sir is an assistant professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad, India, with expertise in advanced fabrication technologies, including additive manufacturing and laser cladding. Welcome, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mansa. So, uh, Dr. Madhikar, can I share my screen? Please, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I hope you are able to see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this talk. Okay. So I am Dr. Gopinath, uh, working as assistant professor at IIT Hyderabad. So basically, I will try to focus more on uh, laser directed energy deposition. So I hope by this time you might have seen various additive manufacturing processes, metal based essentially, like wire arc additive manufacturing, powder bed fusion process. And today I will talk more about DED process and uh, a fundamental aspect of it. Okay. So overall, this is the outline, basic outline of the process. More I will try to focus on the physics of the process and uh, how to understand the process. Let us say you have a new system with you. How can you optimize it or what are the aspects you should look into that new system in order to optimize your process? So this I have categorized into laser material interaction. Then there is something called as energy apportionment in DED process. Okay, I, I, we will try to you know explain some process methods by using which you can calculate this energy apportionment. Then we will also like try to look into a know-how on process optimization because see whenever we talk about additive manufacturing, one of the major issue is repeatability and reproducibility. Repeatability is if I am doing a component today and again, I want to produce the same component tomorrow, am I able to re uh, repeat it or not? Okay, it's on the same side. Reproducibility is I made a component based on some parametric optimization and you want to adopt that process parametric window and produce that component at your site. Okay, so these two are very major challenges in additive manufacturing. Okay, so if the process has some such kind of, uh, you know, uh, variation with respect to the mission, what we are using, or with respect to the climatic condition, then how do you optimize the process? That is what we are going to discuss in the first three sections. And then we will see one of the important parameter that is role of standoff distance in LDED process. Also, based on this particular whatever observations we have made in the process physics, there is one pressing problem in additive manufacturing that is, you know, heat accumulation effect, which results in waviness or um, poor quality deposition and other things. Now, based on this fundamental understanding, how are we going to control at least the waviness or, you know, to a greater extent, how can we control the, what we call it as um, geometry. So that we will try to look into. Now, if we talk about laser directed energy deposition. Okay, I am taking uh, directed energy deposition from the ASTM standards. There are several other names for it, but typically we call it as directed energy deposition process. Now, if you look at the schematic, this is how the process looks like. Essentially, you have a laser beam going into a nozzle. Okay, so this nozzle, if you see from here, you are giving a shielding gas, and then there is one more coagial nozzle. Okay, means these are two cones 
of different diameter the smaller one goes inside them the bigger one goes outside and whenever there is a change in the diameter then what happens there is a an annular channel so through through that channel coaxial channel we are trying to feed the powder now as long as the powder and the laser are inside the nozzle they are not interacting with each other essentially you can see till this point the laser is coming out without interacting with the powder the moment powder comes out of this nozzle the laser starts interacting with it and it will start melting the powder and it will deposit the powder now if the same thing if you want to see sequentially this is how it looks like the first one the first step typically if this is our nozzle whatever we are looking at the nozzle over here so the same thing here so the this schematic represents the cross section of this nozzle but actual nozzle looks like this and you can see the powder is flowing out of this nozzle and it is focusing at one particular point and again it is defocusing so this is a step 1 step 2 you will switch on your laser the moment you start switching on the laser you can see this particular zone where the laser and material are interacting which essentially means laser is getting absorbed in this powder particles and it is trying to heat up the powder particles one important thing which we need to understand is this laser is not melting the powder in air okay typically in laser directed energy deposition process metal powder does not melt in air okay the main important thing we need to understand whenever you have a powder cloud like this and when from the center laser is coming some of the laser energy is absorbed by this powder and the remaining transfers to the substrate or transmits to the substrate and because of that energy substrate melts and into that molten pool this heated powder particles goes in and then they will melt okay so this is one major important thing which we need to understand in direct energy deposition that it will not melt in air powder will not melt in air rather it goes to substrate and, and sits into the molten pool and then it melts sorry to interrupt sir yes can i ask one small question here sure sure definitely that means when it is melting the substrate eh? substrate is it in vacuum or inert atmosphere or just open air is so, yes good now if you see there are three kind of gases typically that we use in directed energy deposition the first one is shielding gas right now if you see the shielding gas enters here and it comes out of the nozzle so this shielding gas is typically argon or inert gas so it is going to shield your molten pool this is gas 1 the gas 2 is whenever you are talking about the powder so powder cannot flow on its own so someone should carry that powder into the processing zone that is done by the carrier gas so that is also an argon so from the outer nozzle again argon is coming which is going to shield this molten pool in addition to that most of the commercial nozzles including our nozzle has one more cone here actually here it is not represented in this schematic you will have one more cone through which we send shaping gas means if you see the powder is coming out of the nozzle the moment it comes out of the nozzle it is not supposed to diverge it is supposed to keep focused okay for that from the outer side we again give one more gas which we call it as shaping gas so that this foc this powder gets focused at one point again that is argon so so all these uh, gases that is coming out of this nozzle act as a shielding environment that is the only environment we give it is neither under vacuum nor the whole machine is under a controlled atmosphere only the zone wherever you are depositing is under an argon jacket is it clear yes sir clear yeah. very good thank you sir thank you yes so there are several three gases that we use now once all of these things are done this is what you can use or deposit it okay so what here you are seeing is an uh, inconel 718 material being deposited we are trying to make a converging diverging nozzle just like your uh, you know rocket nozzle at its end fine so typically these are the sequence of steps involved in a ded process now if you look at its fundamental uh, you know interaction between the laser and what we call it as powder now let us see what is happening within this zone we are assuming you have the best nozzle possible from that nozzle powder is being blown and just above the processing zone powder and nozzle are interacting nicely okay so under this condition if you 
try to zoom in and look at what is happening this is something which happens first you have powder particles because the powder particles are coming through the nozzle this is what we call it as powder cloud density okay just assume you have a sun clouds and the earth surface so whenever in the daytime the sunlight comes it penetrates through the clouds as well as it reflects through the clouds so whatever that penetrates through the clouds reaches to the earth surface so you have a denser cloud less amount of sunlight we will receive if it is a lighter uh, cloud then we will have a more sunlight if there are no clouds full sunlight will come down similarly this powder cloud density is one of the important parameter so how do we control it you can increase the powder mass flow rate let us say initially you are doing it 10 gram per minute you can increase it to 20 30 40 50 means the number of powder particles in this laser interaction zone will increase now what happens whatever the laser that is coming out of your nozzle has it some of the energy is being absorbed by these particles now wherever there are gaps that energy is passing through it and it is reaching to the substrate and whatever the energy that is reaching to the substrate actually melts the substrate and then these heated particles whichever uh, got heated with, with a laser comes into them and then they are going to liquefy and once the laser is switched off it will solidify so this is the basic process yes there might be some questions uh, you know can't we melt the powder particle yes you can melt the powder particle but the moment you melt the powder particle we will be using that particular process for something else that i will try to cover at the last but essentially in laser cladding powder particles are not expected to melt in air rather they are just getting heated up and go into the molten pool sit in this molten pool take the heat from the molten pool as well as the laser coming from the top and then melt so this is basic process now it is very essential to understand what is the energy reaching to the substrate and what if the energy reaching to the substrate is higher or what if energy reaching to the substrate is very lower and what if the energy is optimum so typically we are saying to extreme conditions where energy reaching to the substrate is less the other one is energy reaching to the substrate is high in between it's an optimum now first of all before we jump into that stage to understand or look into what is happening let us try to characterize it okay so this is a typical experimental setup that at present we are using in our lab where you can see i have a nozzle from the nozzle i am getting the laser beam and the powder so this is the focal point of the powder let us assume what is the focal point of laser sorry powder so if you look in this video whatever the powder that is coming out of the nozzle it is focusing at this point so right now i am considering this point as focal point and typically whenever we do at any deposition we try to keep our substrate at this focal point so that the deposition is maximum if you keep above and if you cut the cross section of this powder stream and see it will be like a donut the distribution of powder is like a donut which essentially means at the center there is no powder and there is a ring around where there is a powder and beyond that ring there is no powder because it is coming through a halo cone so that's the reason we keep the substrate at this particular focus point now what we are trying to do in this particular study is instead of placing the substrate over here i have removed the substrate and i kept a gas jet okay which essentially means i am allowing the powder and the laser to interact with each other till this in, uh, whatever this processing zone is and after that i am blowing away the powder so now whatever the energy that is left out which is expected to reach the substrate is now coming and falling on a energy meter or what we call it as a power meter so essentially it will tell what is the laser energy that is falling onto it okay now i know what is my input energy now i know what is my energy reaching to the substrate so now i know the fraction what is the amount of energy that is absorbed by the powder what is the amount of energy that is coming onto my power meter so in reality if you look this is how it looks like okay so this is the nozzle the powder is coming through it 
and the laser is also coming and at 20 mm sod we are keeping this gas jet and we are trying to blow away the powder so that whatever the remaining energy is available that comes and falls onto my power meter telling me what is exactly happening okay now if we look into these aspects like let us say first what are we what we are saying is standoff distance is 20, 15 mm okay let us talk about 15 mm sod let's go back here and see what is 15 mm so this is 20 mm that is the focal point of the powder 5 mm above is the 15 mm and 5 mm below is the 25 mm okay we are taking three zones and i know that 20 mm is optimum for me and above 5 mm and below 5 mm i'm trying to take now if you look at that very carefully this is what happens what is that as you can see in case of 50 let us forget about 10 liter per minute 20 liter per minute carrier gas flow rate let us not discuss about that at this moment but if you see whenever you have a 15 mm sod the energy reaching to the substrate is almost close to 550 watt whereas the supplied energy is or supplied power is 600 watt which essentially means more or less 90 to 95 percent of the energy is reaching to the substrate okay whatever the uh, uh, what you call um, the powder absorbing is very 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 minimal then we will shift to 20 mm sod 20 mm means the focal point is on the substrate surface focal point of the powder remember then you can see from almost like 550 the values are ranging between 575 to somewhere around 400 okay which essentially means another 150 watt is coupling into powder rather than the substrate close to 200 watt is coupling into your powder okay and only 400 watt is reaching to the substrate then i am going to the third case where my standoff distance is 25 means the laser and powder will interact for a longer time right and obviously it is expected that more energy goes into the powder than the substrate fine now if you do that if you can you can see over here at one particular parameter the energy reaching to the substrate is coming close to 350 so essentially here the takeaway point you need not worry about all these graphs and points but the takeaway point essentially here is standoff distance plays a vital role and it dictates what is the amount of energy going into the powder what is the amount of energy going into the substrate now based on the discussion whatever we till uh, till i mean like whatever we had till now can anyone tell me what is the optimum one out of these three uh, between it's around 20 around 20 right yeah yes so this is considering the fact that my deposition is going very well okay now at the end of this presentation i will make you realize or understand that all these three are good for a particular circumstance okay that is very much important to understand what is the circumstance why is it important how suddenly let us say this 15 mm which is considered to be bad how it suddenly became good okay similarly a 25 mm standoff distance again which is considered to be bad how it became good so that we will try to understand if we can understand these three regimes you more or less know the fundamentals of DED process. Okay. Whereas the parametric window is a variable. Okay. It depends upon the kind of laser you are using. It depends upon the kind of nozzle you are using or kind of kinematic system you are using. So, but if you know the fundamental, that window can be optimized very quickly. Now, just to add to some of the points whatever we have discussed why these kind of things are happening okay now let us go to here typically whenever we talk about the process parameters in laser directed energy deposition people will talk about scan speed okay that is what is the speed at which your laser is scanning the substrate second one what is the laser power because power defines what is the energy available then we discuss about the diameter which dictates the energy density or the power density so these are the three parameters which talks about the energy available 
Okay. Now, what I'm trying to do is, if you see at the bottom, I kept my power constant, scan speed constant, spot diameter constant, standoff distance constant. I kept all the energy input parameters constant. I'm not at all touching the amount of energy input. Now, what is that I am varying? Because if you look into the literature or you search over the internet, you will see a lot of studies where these values were changed. Okay. But here, since we are, as, as I have already said, we are looking from the fundamental perspective. We don't want to change this. Now, what are we actually changing here? Now, if you look at here, carrier gas flow rate means, as I told you, the powder cannot come on its own into the nozzle and a drop out of the nozzle. Someone should carry it, which is the carrier gas flow or the carrier gas. Now, what I'm saying is, I'm changing my carrier gas flow rate. Sorry, this on the y-axis is the carrier gas flow rate. That is 10 liter per minute, 20 liter per minute, 30 liter per minute and 40 liter per minute. Parallelly, I also told you powder cloud density is dictated by what are the number of powder particles available at any given point of time. That can be controlled by varying the powder mass flow rate. So I'm not changing any energy input parameters, rather two things I am changing. One is your carrier gas flow rate. The other one is the powder mass flow rate. Now, just for an instance, you don't look at all these you know, images, just concentrate on this 50 gram per minute. Now, for a 50 gram per minute powder mass flow rate, I am using 10 liter per minute gas flow rate and 40 liter per minute gas flow rate. Now, what is the observation you can make in this? Participants, now let us say I talk about this image, the first one and the last one. What is that you are observing there? What is the change you are observing? I think the focal point shifted upwards. Plus, uh, little bit divergence is there, sir. Divergence is there in this one or this one? Uh, at the bottom one at high flow rate. Yes. Apart from that, if you look at this focal point width, it got reduced, isn't it? Yes. Yes, sir. Reduced. It became, became much finer. Up. Correct. Yeah. Finer. What does that mean? Means you have, let us say, 10 particles. They are kept at a larger distance from each other in this in this case whereas in this case all the 10 particles are kept close to each other means we are talking about a uh, you know dense cloud over here and very lighter cloud over here means this particular condition will allow more amount of energy to go into the substrate whereas this particular condition will allow more i mean like slightly higher amount of energy going into the powder and lesser into the substrate. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. That's true. Yes. Perfect. So this is very important to understand. Now we will try to understand, understand its effect on your deposition. Now, again, don't consider the last row. Okay. Consider the, sorry, last column, consider the first column. Now, if you see, I am using 25 gram per minute is my powder mass flow rate and in one case i'm using 10 liter per minute 20 liter per minute 30 liter per minute and 40 liter per minute and we observed that as i increase my carrier gas flow rate my powder is focusing tighter and tighter now if you see in the first case this is the deposition okay and you have a significant amount of melting the of the substrate now so this is your substrate surface. Okay. Now based on that, if you try to look at this, so this is the deposition, what we call it as, and whatever we have here is the melting of the substrate. Okay. The dotted line is the melting of the substrate and whatever this line is there is the deposition. You can see it is 50, 50, 50% 50 of the substrate is getting melted. I mean like, or I will keep it in a different way. Whatever the energy that was available, out of that 50% is consumed in melting the substrate and remaining 50 is consumed in deposition. Okay. Which is actually, or typically we call in uh, what we call DED. This is not good. 
Now, when I went to 20 gram per minute, maybe this 50 50 became something around 70 30. And when I go to 30 liter per minute, it became 80 20. And when I go to 40 liter per minute, it became 90 10. So you can understand that instead of changing the process parameters, if at all you can control the powder cloud density or vary the powder cloud density, you will be in a position to change the bead deposition quality. Okay, so that is something which is very important to understand. So I can say that as I'm increasing my carrier, so carrier gas flow rate, I'm getting better, better and better clad beads or the more amount of deposition is happening rather than melting. But remember, can it go and keep tightly focusing it more and more and more and more? No, you cannot do that because there is something called as boiling phenomena in DED process. What is this boiling phenomena? You just take uh, a molten pool or a molten metal and keep it on a copper substrate which is at room temperature or a steel substrate which is at room temperature. Immediately, you will observe that this molten pool, whatever drop you kept it on the steel surface or the copper substrate will convert into a ball because of the surface tension. The same is with your dosa pan. Let us say you have a dosa pan which is extremely hot. You keep a drop of water in it. Rather than spreading, it takes a shape of a bubble. Okay. This is all because of the surface tensions. So, whenever your surface, this kind of balling phenomena occurs, please understand whenever we call about, uh, whenever we talk about additive manufacturing, it is a overlaying and overlapping deposition process. What do you mean by that? I'll just show you. Uh, just give me a minute. Point. Now, if you see, this is one bead, but additive manufacturing is a layer by layer deposition process. Now, when you are calling layer by layer, if this is your substrate, assume this is one track, you can deposit one track on this. But you can in, again one more and one more. You can keep on depositing and build it. Now, but essentially, if you see over here, what is happening? You are depositing a wall of around one mm thickness. But my demand is I want a wall mm wall of um, let us say 10 mm thickness. Then what I will do? The same thing I will do. But this is my one mm bead. This is another one mm bead. This is another one mm bead. This is another one bit. So this is what we call it as overlaying. This is what we call it as overlapping. So typically, whenever we talk about surface engineering applications or cladding applications, we go with overlapping. Whenever you talk about thin wall applications, you will go with overlaying. But when you talk about additive manufacturing, a combination of both will be used. Means again, over this, you will keep depositing. Right now, let us assume I am using this kind of bead geometry for overlapping strategy. Then what will happen now if this is my substrate, my bead is like this because of balling. Now, whenever I go for another deposition, you will observe that this zone is what we call it as shadowing zone means it is if you are allowing the light from this side to fall onto this bead. This particular location just below this curve will not see any light, right? And your laser is also light, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. That is what laser is. So this laser energy will not be able to reach this shadowed region. So essentially then what will happen? This is one bit. The other bit will come here. So here there will be a porosity left. What we call it as an inter-run porosity. So that's the reason you should not focus them too tight like this. Okay. So somewhere around these two are good for us. Fine. So typically we define this by a wetting angle. Wetting angle below 70, 75 is good. You will not get any kind of um, what we call it as porosity, inter-run porosity. But if you look at here, the wetting angle is more than 90. Okay. 
this is more than 90. So whenever the wetting angle is more than 90, then you will end up with interrun porosity. Okay. So first thing, whenever we talk about additive manufacturing, at a bead level, we say that the dilution should be minimum, wetting angle should be less than 75, so that when you do overlaying and overlapping, you will not end up with kind of what we call it as interrun porosity. So based on that, you can see in, out of all these... Sorry, can you repeat that statement? You said two statements. One is that uh, yes. wetting angle should be less than 70. Le less than 70, 75. Yeah. Other okay. one you said? Dilution. A dilution. Okay. Dilution means what is the amount of substrate you are melting. So dilution has a separate formula which talks that let us say this is the area of the melt, substrate melt. Now let us say area of substrate melt divided by area of substrate melt plus area of clad. So whatever that is above, we call it as clad. So this is this is like what is the fraction of substrate melting compared to the overall melt you have. This, this is what we call it as dilution. So this dilution should be less than 20%. We go up to 30%. So typically if you open any textbook, it says dilution should be less than 5%. If it is more than 5%, then they call it as alloying. Okay. But the textbook thing does not translate so easily in the application. So that's why whenever we do the application oriented work, it goes up to 20%. If you go up to 20%, you will get good depositions. That is what we say. But if you go by textbook definition, 5% is the critical value. Okay. Now, again, so the one is we looked at how the power cloud density is affecting. And you also know how to characterize the energy reaching to the substrate and energy reaching to the powder that you know and what are its effects general effects okay please don't consider any of these parameters what we are talking is we are isolating the parameters we are only talking about the physics these parameters will completely change from system to system this cannot be translated okay there are several reasons for it one is your nozzle design from which company you are buying that nozzle what is its design the other one is the type of laser, let us say laser wavelength. So whenever we talk about absorptivity of a material, it depends upon the wavelength of the laser you are using. I may be using a fiber laser which has 1070 nanometer wavelength. You may be using a diode laser which has 900 nanometer. Someone use, might be using a green laser which has 532 nanometer. So depending upon these wavelengths, the absorptivity of any material changes. So there are too many variations. So that's what I'm saying. This is all about the process physics. The numbers, whatever given are immaterial when we talk about reproducibility. Okay. All the, but all these things can be used to optimize any kind of system. Okay. Now coming back to your standoff distance. If you remember, we looked at three standoff distances. One is 15 mm. Okay. This is the 15 mm SOD. 20 mm, 25 mm. Now we are looking at how are the beads whenever we are using these kind of standoff distances. You can see in 15 mm SOD, when we looked at the energy reaching to the substrate, like I said, 90 to 95 percent of the energy is reaching to the substrate. So that is what causing huge amount of melting. So you can say dilution is almost close to 80 percent. Okay, but what I said is 20%. So this is not at all good. Is it so? We will look at it. Okay. Now here, if you look at this one, the dilution is close to 20% and its wetting angle is also close to 70 degree. So this is good. Then comes here. If you look at here, the dilution is less than 5%. Means the dilution is very important in additive manufacturing because it dictates the metallurgical bonding between the deposited material and the already existing material at the bottom. Okay, now why I'm calling already existing material, why not substrate? Because if this is the first layer, when I go to the second layer, this is my substrate. Okay, so that's what I'm calling already existing layer. So if this is beyond a, below a certain percent, which essentially means these are not fusing properly. Okay, so it may be good 
it may be bad okay but we will see whether it is good or bad or can we use this for some other application that we will try to see over here okay now we are saying that 15 mm is bad at this moment 25 mm is bad at this moment and we are saying 20 mm is good okay now with this conclusion which may change at the end we will proceed to the next topic now which one is good okay this question we will leave it before we enter the next topic now based on these particular parameters whatever i have seen whatever i have showed this is a kind of optimum window what we are getting okay sometimes this 600 may go to 400 800 may go to 1200 that depends again i like i told you repeatability and reproducibility i'm talking about reproducibility part but based on this study you will be able to first understand the process develop a process parametric window and you can also develop new processes or troubleshoot the problems which you face in additive manufacturing now let us go to that that is predicting waviness and controlling waviness predicting and controlling waviness in additive manufacturing now before i go to here typically okay that figure is not available with me but i will tell you what happens in additive manufacturing now if this is your substrate okay and you are depositing one layer over here or the one bead so this is at just deposited so let us assume that this is at melting point but whereas your substrate is at room temperature this is at melting point now immediately what happens the heat will be conducted into the substrate so it will solidify very quickly the moment it solidifies very quickly this molten pool cannot flow in this direction or in this direction further it gets frozen now let us assume what happens after five layers one two three four five now what happens i think the quenching up. effect will be less i think as it goes upwards what is which effect quenching quenching I mean. quenching effect yes so now what happens first thing all substrate is preheated because the earlier it has absorbed the energy from these four layers so it is no more at room temperature right parallelly earlier it was in 3d heat conduction because it is conducting heat in every direction into the substrate now what happens it has to be a 2d it has to go th uh, conduct through this fine wall now because of this heat accumulation effect as well as uh, you know poor conduction what will happen is as these beads will either start to overflow that will result in geometrical inaccuracies as you keep building up this wall now let us see is it true does it really happen in reality okay so to understand that what we have done just let me go back once to understand this heating effects and everything what we did this is our experimental setup and we kept two pyrometers pyrometers are essentially devices non-contact type devices which will measure the temperature okay based on the radiation emitting from the molten pool now what happens this one of this pyrometer is continuously monitoring what is the temperature of the layer one okay and the second one is monitoring the temperature of uh, the current layers being deposited means as i keep building on okay what is the temperature of the layer being deposited is monitored by this guy or this parameter and what is the temperature of the first bead which was deposited will be continuously monitored by this one okay now if you look at those temperature signals this is what is happening now this is the first layer when it got heated up and cooled down and when the second layer is being deposited again is heating up and cooling down but this cooling down is not coming to the minimum detectable temperature of the parameter rather as the number of layers are increasing this is accumulating why is it accumulating just to give an idea uh, sorry give me a minute Now, if you look at this one, okay, 
Now, if you look at this video, you look at the what is happening to the first layer when it is getting deposited. Once the first track is deposited, you cannot see any red hot zone. Second track, no red hot zone. Third track, more or less no red hot zone. Now, as the layer number increases, you see what is happening. Before the next layer is being deposited, your, your whatever the deposited layers are, they are still in red hot zone. That is what happening here. Heat is getting accumulated. Okay. So in this video, what we have done, we intentionally took a smaller scan length so that heat accumulation effect can be easily you know, realized. So you can see that from the first layer to the last layer, the kind of thermal history each layer is experiencing is very different. Now, forget about the waviness. When we talk about metallurgy, physical metallurgy, we say TTT curves, time temperature transformation curves, which are essentially depending on cooling rate. Now, if that is true, you look at what is the cooling rate of the first layer. It is high. What happens to the in between? It is moderate. What happens to the final layers? They are pretty much slow. Okay, so because of this, you will also have a microstructural inhomogeneity causing anisotropy in additive manufacturing. One of the reasons for anisotropy is this. There are several other reasons which we are not going to discuss now, but this can cause a gradient in the microstructure of your deposition. Means if you let us say if this component is subjected to some kind of erosion, the first layer which has solidified very fast will have a better erosion resistance whereas the top layer which has cooled very slow could not develop any hard face or a refined microstructure will worn out early so not just waviness it will also affect your microstructure okay we will leave microstructure here and we will go to geometry now like i said what is happening at the end the molten pool has a lot of time and temperature so it can flow out so essentially, if you want to keep it in a technical words, the molten pool becomes unstable. The moment molten pool becomes unstable, you will encounter this kind of waviness. Now, any solution from your side to control this waviness? Okay. Participants? Okay. <clears throat> Maybe you can have some water cooled uh, bottom or so you are chill. trying to chill, right? Understood. So you are talking about a passive cooling or active cooling. Okay. One is if you are chilling, if you are having a chilled substrate, means it's active, means continuously you are removing the heat. Or if you have a copper backing which has higher thermal conductivity, then we call it as passive cooling because there is nothing active or actively it is not removing. Whatever it is coming to it, it is removing and accumulating. But from the copper plate, we are not taking it away. Fine. But only problem with this that kind of technique is. For these kind of substrates or the depositions where are very which are very small, that looks like a feasible uh, you know option. But you cannot use water or cool use uh, cool this one directly using water. That water has to flow through the substrate or below the substrate. But when it goes for these kind of depositions, now you are heating at this location. Just give me a minute, pointer. Let me take one. Sorry. Yeah, you are heating at this location and your substrate or whatever passive cooling, active cooling that you are giving is at this location. Now, the first problem is the heat from here has to conduct till this location. Now, if there is a high temperature gradient, it will conduct fast. But the problem is the area through which or the cross section through which it has to conduct is very small. So, this may not be effective, this whatever active cooling or passive cooling we are talking about may not be effective beyond a certain number of layers. Okay, so that is where we, we call something called as adaptive control or institute control kind of thing. What we are trying to do is, okay, now I know after certain number of layers, it is continuously getting accumulated. Now, let us come back to this is this particular signal is for this particular small component. We kept it because it's easy to understand and realize. It's just for an explanation. But now come back to this kind of component. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sir. Please, please. How about uh, providing convective heat flow 
a blanket like some helium gas blanket only a particular level it will be flowing no the problem here is you are dealing with the powder any kind of gas flow from any direction you give that will affect the powder flow characteristics okay then ultimately it will affect your geometry of deposition or the deposition quality okay okay sir. so okay. that's why lateral or any side you cannot give the gas sir no. excuse yes. me yes if you control if you optimize the powder flow rate then now powder flow rate means see any of you are melting it see whether it is thin deposition thick deposition melting is melting maybe in thick deposition heat accumulation will effect will come much early thin deposition it will come slightly later but either oh, way, to, to reduce the pressure waviness to reduce the waviness waviness at the top structure we have shown no about no, that's what i'm saying this waviness is due to the heat accumulation right now mm -hmm. let us say you are using a higher power mass flow rate maybe after 50 layers or 30 layers the waviness will start if you are using yes, lower power mass flow rate it will happen at about 80 or 100 layers but if not at this timeline in the next timeline it will happen because heat accumulation is expected to happen okay clear is it clear yes sir yes sir yeah so for that what you can do or what we have done is okay we are continuously monitoring remember now the deposition length is slightly larger so the way you are observing here within the first second third fourth heat accumulation is continuously increasing that kind of thing will not happen because now our deposition length is bigger so by the time it travels from this point to this point and come back this will cool down okay but it will happen at a different time step that is what i'm trying to say now here what we are trying to do okay we are looking at this temperature again this is a open loop system it's not a closed loop we are manually doing it okay so here you see every time the temperature of this molten pool is dropping down to the minimum detectable temperature so you need not do anything just relax and watch the process but after few layers like 11th to 20th you can see here the heat accumulation has started happening okay now you have to react and do something now what is that you want to react and what is that you want to do is important okay so you have to understand that the input parameters are energy input parameters are laser power scan speed spot diameter you cannot change spot diameter because it defines what is the width of your deposition in a, in majority of the times then you have to change either power or scan speed both are equally good but if you want to change the power you should have a continuous control over the laser system that any time you want to change you should be able to change it other than that is the speed at which you are depositing the speed is only just controlled by a stepper motor okay it is easy to control see complicated or complex or industrial grade systems typically modulate laser power but at lab scale it is tough so you can control what we call it as a uh, scan speed now what we have done we have increased the scan speed a little bit the moment you increase the scan speed energy input per unit length will reduce so again from this state you can come back to this state fine so here again you see it dropped down to the minimum detectable temperature sir, sorry yes. sorry to disturb you yes please sir at a in a diagram and b diagram if you compare that particular uh, is it a horizontal line delay is the time delay it's a horizontal line yes yes horizontal line is the not, not the time, time. delay time no, delay not, to restart the process layer. no no it's not the time delay what happening is so now you let us say you have started depositing here and my pyrometer is temp taking the temperature from center of this okay now you will come like this and whenever the pyrometer comes here the temperature goes up right and when the laser passes it will start dropping down now again the heating at this position will only take place when the laser goes all the way to this point and return back now by the time it is going from this point and returning back whatever the time is available in that time it is cooling down now our temperature can detect sorry our pyrometer can detect the temperature from 400 degree centigrade so what is happening before it is going from here and coming back the temperature is falling be below 400 and you are seeing a flat line 
Okay. So in the B in the B diagram, which the flat line is very reduced. So where your scan rate is improved. No, in the B, what is happening? This is here, not here. The the horizontal line is red. Size is reduced when compared to A. Yeah, because heat is getting accumulated. Okay, so that defines the heat accumulation effects. Okay, see, uh, if you look at this one particular pulse, let me see if I can zoom in. Good. If you look at this one particular pulse, this is what we call it as heating cycle. And once the laser moves from the point of interest, it will start cooling down. This is the cooling cycle. So heating and cooling. So you can see it is narrow. But when it comes to here, you can see it is heating and the cooling is slow here. Slowly reduced. Yes, because heat is getting accumulated. Yes. Now then what we did, we changed the velocity. The moment you change the velocity, energy input per unit length changes and again it will become smaller. Because energy yes, sir, sir. reduced, it became very fast cooling. So essentially, this is one way to control the heat accumulation effect. Thank you, sir. Okay. Now, apparently it seems everything is going well because we are changing the scan speed. But one thing we have to understand beyond a certain value, we cannot change the velocity. Okay. That we have to live with it. But in DED process, now assume you are depositing a layer one. Just give me a minute. Huh? I just take it. Now, when you are depositing the layer one, this is the layer one. Okay. So the nozzle is here. And whatever gases, exactly what we are talking previously, they are nicely covering the molten pool. And whatever here, the substrate is acting as a stopper. So it will go back and forth and it will nicely cover it. Now, just imagine you have an 80 mm, 90 mm, 100 mm wall means this is your substrate and on this you have this wall and here is your nozzle let us say like this so whatever the gas is coming it is going here and it will leave out so essentially the kind of efficient shielding you are getting here you may not get this over here see i am not saying that as you increase the height, the shielding will become inefficient. No. What I'm trying to say is, it is more effective here. Here it is slightly ineffective. Slightly. Okay. Now, and also you have to understand that sometimes your powders will have some kind of oxygen because they are small in size. They take the, absorb the moisture or they catch the oxygen. All those things will happen. And always in oxidation process is an exothermic reaction. So it will add some amount of heat because of such kind of events, because of improper or inefficient shielding or oxidation coming out of a, some particle. Again, this kind of waviness will come in. Okay. Now the question is, how do I control now? Because this cannot be controlled by changing your velocity because this is coming out of oxidation. Right. Or some kind of some random event or impurity, whatever you call. Okay. Now, how or else let us say you are depositing this, suddenly someone has switched on the fan. That itself is good enough to cause this kind of waviness. Now the question is, will you discard this deposition and start the deposition new because you have this waviness or are you going to do something such that this waviness can be covered? Okay. So that is where we will try to again recall our understanding about standoff distance. Now what we are saying, if the standoff distance is above or if the standoff distance is such that the focal point of the powder is below, means here if you look at the powder cloud density, the distribution, it will be like this. Because it's coming out of a halo cone, the distribution of powder is in this and at the center there is a hole. So excess amount of melting is happening. This is we have already seen. Okay. And you know, at 20 mm distance, there is a nice deposition happening. Now what we can do? Okay. Now what we can do? Let us say my top surface is something became wavy like this. Okay. Now, if at a particular point of time, when it reaches to a critical value, if I can set my standoff distance with respect to this plane, 
okay with respect to this plane as 20 mm can you tell me what will happen then participants now let us say this valley i am selecting as 20 mm okay now what will happen to the deposition in the valley and deposition at the peak so this deposition will happen in valley this kind of deposition will happen in the peak am i correct because the 20 mm sod is with respect to the valley whereas above these points are above the 20 mm means a stand of distance 17 stand of distance 16 or 15 or 14 kind of stuff now what will happen there will be a higher amount of deposition in the valley and there will be higher amount of melting in the peak so if you can choose this very judiciously okay then what is going to happen your peaks will get melted valleys will get filled are you getting this point participants sir should we be varying the stand of distance while laying yes while depositing once you observe too much of waviness what i am suggesting is you just understand what is your uh, valley distance from the peak okay and you set the stand of distance in such a way that 20 mm stand of distance will be set with respect to valley and with respect to peak it will be less than 20 it can be 19 18 15 14 kind of stuff okay then that means the laser beam has to be kind of oscillatory oh, moving yes. up and down no no the nozzle will move up and down that's it okay okay only the nozzle stand of distance okay i will define the definition stand of distance is the distance between the tip of the nozzle and substrate surface this is what we call it as stand of distance now if at all i have to change this i just have to move my nozzle up and down okay. agreed sir yes then what because substrate is changing yes okay so substrate distance is changing because of this peak and valley if you can choose it very judiciously then you will be able to build or in situ control that kind of waviness. Okay. Now, if you remember, earlier I said this is bad. But now I am saying that is good. That can help you in kind of controlling waviness which came because of an uncontrolled parameter. Sir, okay. uh, a small yeah. doubt. Yes. If you reduce the factor height between nozzle tip and the separate uh, top surface, mm -hmm. If it, uh, if it is reduced means automatically the layer will get the more uh, layer the top layer will take more heat no when compared to previous condition no, no, so you... that's a heat accumulation will be it's a time duration will be more no no see this is an energy balancing see in one case you are depositing more the other case you are melting so either case the amount of energy you are supplying is the same but how you are utilizing this energy is different. See, once this kind of deposition is done, if you calculate the melt volume, in everywhere the amount of material melt is same. But whether the melt is coming from the new powder coming out of the nozzle or the melt is coming of melting of these peaks may be different. But volume of the material melt is same. So the heat accumulation effects will be the same. Yes, you can. Okay, okay, just one small clarification, sir. Yes. Do you allow the workstation to move up and down or the nozzle to oscillate? It is up to you. Whatever kinematic system you have, you can move it. Okay. So, in our case, nozzle moves and up and down. But if some kinematic system has its stage moving up and down, you can move that one also. So, is this available in IoT Hyderabad, sir? Yes. So the, whatever results we are showing is with our results only. Yeah. So, if you do that kind of studies, you will be able to deposit 212 layers. See, once you reach 212 or 100 layers, right, it more or less process saturates. It keeps on depositing. Okay. So, these are the kind of fundamentals. If you know, you know, then you will understand how to troubleshoot it. Okay. The essential idea in this whole process or in this presentation is to make you understand the process so that you can troubleshoot whenever you see some kind of 
defects okay now the method what we want to implement not at implemented is something this right now we are looking at the what we call this as waviness and then we are manually means open loop manually we are changing the stand of distance up and down but now what we are targeting is can we have a displacement sensor laser based non contact type and keep on depositing so i will say an upper control limit and lower control limit okay one is the peak the other one is the valley as long as my waviness is within this upper control and lower control limit i will keep on depositing once the waviness reaches either upper control or lower control limit since i have a displacement sensor i can know what is my r max that is the distance between the peak maximum peak and maximum valley so that will give me the maximum difference between a peak and valley if i know that then i am supposed to set my stand of distance in such a way that it matches with the valley point right so this is a kind of adaptive control which we are trying to implement we haven't implemented yet but this, this is a kind of what we call a uh, idea we are projecting so that if we can implement this it can happen in real time okay then comes something called as extreme high speed laser cladding now if we go back we said this is bad but now we have more or less understood this is also good and it has certain application okay then what about this one this we haven't discussed yet where most of the energy is getting coupled into the powder that we haven't discussed yet that is where this particular process comes what we call it as extreme high speed laser cladding now what is this extreme high speed laser cladding nothing what we are trying to do it over here is we are allowing the laser and powder to interact more means we are going into a higher stand of distance like 25 mm so that most of the energy is being deposited or en energy is absorbed by the powder also typically if you have seen i have used 600 watt for deposition or the cladding or additive manufacturing instead of that now i will use 2 kilowatt or the 2000 watt so that condition 1 most of the energy should get coupled with the powder condition 2 the coupled energy whatever the energy that is getting coupled with the powder should be able to melt the powder particle before it reaches to the substrate okay remember either it should be its surface should reach to the melting point or it should be ready to melt condition means it is clo reaching close to its solidest temperature before it gets into goes near the substrate this is what we call it as extreme high speed laser cladding process because again typically we use 600 mm per minute is the deposition speed mm per minute okay whereas in extreme high speed laser cladding we will use 25000 mm per minute because here i am using very high power second i am ensuring the powder particles are in ready to melt condition or already melt condition so this is highly used for depositing thin protective coatings now how does the process look this is how it looks like you see what are the particles that are getting scattered they are already in red hot condition that is what we are trying to achieve okay means they are in ready to deposit condition just give me a minute so by using that you can develop a protective coating what is this protective coating let us say the material what we have taken here is a mild steel mild steel is very soft it gets corroded it gets worn out but what we are depositing over here is a stellate 6 material okay the moment you have stellate 6 material it is very hard corrosive resistant so this is what we call surface engineering so extreme high speed laser cladding or your regular cladding by changing sm small number of you know by changing you know the process a bit essentially what you are trying to do you are actually trying to work in this domain where most of the energy is being absorbed in your powder then the whole process can be shifted from additive manufacturing to extreme high speed laser cladding so this is the kind of very thin coating 650 micrometer is our, our preliminary studies but now we are able to deposit up to 30 micrometer okay so this is the kind of what we call coatings you can develop 
which are extremely important in any kind of industry where there is a kind of wear is involved or the corrosion is involved this particular process can be very much useful now if you see again if you come back to these points we said this is bad but we realized this is good this is anyhow good we are saying now you can see this also has a potential application in directed energy deposition whether it is additive manufacturing cladding coating or it, uh, anything that uses this kind of deposition process depending upon all these three you have different applications different processes and domains okay so moral of the story is if you want to work in additive this is good but whenever you see additive you have to come back into this and ensure that the waviness is removed and if you want to go for deposition of fine coatings then you exploit this one so this is what your energy apportionment is telling so the moment you understand how the energy apportionment occurs and how you can vary that energy apportionment energy apportionment means what is the energy reaching to the substrate what is the energy reaching to your molten uh, sorry powder particle so the moment you have an understanding of that and how you can vary and how you can control you can actually work on n number of processes i am very much limiting here but there are other processes also this can be extended okay some people want a directional growth means you need to have high solidification high cooling rates so this can be extended for a single blade deposition people were calling nowadays this as extreme high speed additive manufacturing process so i am depositing only one layer because it's a protective coating if i go with 10 50 20 30 40 40 it becomes additive okay where you will observe this kind of columnar or the directional growth which is very much important in your turbine blades aerospace turbine blades you see it has a very columnar structure right this one, is one one uh, thing sir yes uh, let's say somebody is making the ds blade with the standard investment casting root but anyway after the turbine blade is made yes the recording the has this meeting is made, being recorded anyway they are going to give the coating high temperature resistance coatings eh? yes. so those coatings if they are done by this process you described eh? that if that also provides a directional probably that may be supplementary benefit to the blade i do not know okay you are you are working in any organization no i used to work in drdo but right now teaching okay. i am in mean, teaching okay okay fine because see we are doing the same thing for drdo right now that's why i have asked you Okay, so most of this work, whatever you are seeing, is it in collaboration with DRDO? Oh, okay, okay, I got it. Okay. So okay. right now, what we are trying to do is, in fact, use the same process to deposit the thermal barrier coatings. You are essentially talking about TBCs. Exactly. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> we are trying to deposit those kind of coatings on this now. Okay. okay. So if they really, and we, our expectation is, it will give a columnar growth. so we are working on it okay sir thank you and only and another point most of the time these blades get worn out right because of various things okay again the next deposition or the repair you do also should be columnar or directional okay. and this is the process which can give you that kind of directionally repaired blades okay again okay that's true. okay good so, sir excellent okay. thank you right. so one last slide i want to add which we work the most and we like the most is now let us say i was talking about uh, what we call uh, whether the material the powder is melting before reaching to the substrate or after reaching to the substrate so this is the micro ct image of the molten pool okay this we have taken from the reference so you can see as the material is being getting deposited it nicely gets your molten pool is forming once the powder is coming but if you see at the end there is something happening that whatever the powder particles that are coming and depositing on the molten pool at the verge of its solidification okay i i will repeat my statement whatever the powder particles that are coming and sitting on the molten pool at the verge of its solidification will actually partially fuse right so if you see at 640 milliseconds this is how the molten pool is looking extremely smooth 
because it's in liquid state but the moment it is trying to solidify that particles which are coming in the last moment they are coming and getting partially fused onto this molten pool now if you look at your additively manufactured component under scm this is what it looks like okay i mean like in a macro scale the component looks extremely good wow this is a kind of complex component it was deposited but at a micro scale if you go and see this is how the surface looks like so it cannot be used in as is condition and now if you open any kind of uh, you know website over internet it simply says additive manufacturing is a process which gives you lot of design freedom and lot of freedom in depositing a complex component correct it it's you have nicely deposited a complex component but its surface is rough so if you want to machine it you again need a complex kinematic system okay that is where we are also trying to work on something called as laser surface polishing because the moment you have a cutting tool which is a physical tool and it has to go and remove the material physically then you will need a very complex kinematic system but instead of that what and you are actually removing the material so there is that that is no more sustainable because you are producing the chips which essentially you are wasting the metal powder so it's not sustainable so this is where you can do one more magic that is just you switch off the powder flow and you just allow the laser to come out of the nozzle and quickly scan it at a higher scan speed in such a way that whatever this partially fused particles are there they get melted only a thin layer 100 micrometer that's it so there are two processes one is laser surface remelting where the remelting depths will be of the order of 50 500 micrometer 1 mm like so but here in surface polishing our target is to melt the partially fused particles and allow the material because you are overlapping the tracks the surface quality or the poor quality of the surface is because of two reasons one is the waviness the other one is the roughness now we have to take care or we have to remelt the surface in such a way that this partially fused particles will melt and whatever the molten pool ever uh, the material that is available in the peaks will melt and fill this valley okay that is what we call it as laser surface polishing just i want to give this line here that in post processing of additive manufacturing there is something called as laser surface polishing which is required because of this particular reason one of these reason and if you use that you will be able to produce much better surfaces okay so just i have introduced this slide but i am not going deep into this so this is where i would like to stop the talk uh, if you have any questions i will be more than happy to answer uh, dr gopi it's madhukar here yes please i have one question uh, do you see any anisotropy in 3d printed part and if 3d printed parts have anisotropy how can we minimize anisotropy okay see in additively manufactured components typically we see some amount of anisotropy but its magnitude depends upon large lot of parameters okay if if you are uh, you know dilution or the remelting of the previous layer is too high then anisotropy may not come or affect too much but there are two kind of things one is anisotropy because of your scan strategy if always you are following the same scan strategy then the grain growth is oriented towards one direction now let us say um we were like we are talking about a columnar growth or directionally solidified blades sorry now what happens if this is the directionally solidified blade and if i am applying a load in this direction it will perform very nicely but the moment i apply the load in this direction then it will fail much earlier this is what we call it as anisotropy so in laser essentially this kind of directional solidification is more predominant so typically metal based additive manufacturing you will observe some amount of anisotropy but its quantity depends because let us say i am only depositing overlaying then the anisotropy is expected to be slightly higher but if it is overlapping then there are too many number of fronts 
or the what we call solidification friends this may slightly scatter the anisotropy but still it will be there yeah yeah, yeah. so i think uh, there is one question from the chat box okay uh, let me see if there is a question any more questions so are there any alternate method uh to remove top layer, that's the question from Murari. So post-processing of laser policing is costly. Are there any other alternate method to remove top layer? Okay, so one is you can directly go with machining. Okay, but machining may not be costly, but it is not sustainable because you are losing the material. See, we are talking, now we are talking about two aspects. One is how efficiently or how effectively you are using your resources. The second one is how economically you are doing it. Now, if you look at the current scenario, we are talking about industry 4.0 is all about, you know, automation, IOT and other things. But if you, if you look at industry 5.0, it is more about sustainability, circular manufacturing, which essentially means we are not supposed to produce scrap. Okay, so if you remelt it, it is actually you are fusing it back onto the same surface. So it is more sustainable, maybe costly. But the other way is you can machine it. Cost is less, but it's not sustainable because you are producing chips. And those chips are made out of powder particles. These powder particles are made out of gas atomization. That requires a molten pool. Means you have taken an ingot, melted it, gas atomized it, produced the powder, and then you have deposited, now you are making a chip out of it. So the back calculation or the cost of, if you see implications, machining will become more costly. Okay, polishing yeah. will be cheaper. Yes. Uh, there is one, two more questions. Uh, okay. So one last question, and there is a request, one more request. Uh, so the last question is, so can, can you comment on laser surface polishing? What is your take on laser poly surface polishing uh, for tribology points? Okay, for the tribology applications. Yes. Yes, obviously, like I said, we are trying to melt a very thin layer, like 100 micrometer. The moment you are saying very thin layer, the cooling rates will be extremely fast. So in fact, this kind of polishing will improve the surface properties in terms of their wear resistance okay, or indentation or erosion. So it will improve the surface properties because this is more or less equivalent to surface remelting. So obviously this will improve the surface properties. Right. right. So um, uh, there is a request and some of the participants, if you know they want to visit research labs at IIT Hyderabad, Yes. What is the best way to, you know, um, uh, is there an open day at IIT Hyderabad where they can come and see uh, research labs? Uh, there is nothing like open day, but you can always uh, contact the concerned faculty, uh, the kind of equipment you want to look at. Okay. And then you can drop a message or mail to them because all our uh, details were available on our website. You can drop a mail and typically we don't say no to anyone. We'll be more than happy to allow the students to come and visit our labs. Okay. okay. But unlike other government labs, uh, I don't think we have an open day, but it's a good suggestion. Maybe we will take it forward to directors. Yeah. Because yeah, I have day. seen several CSIR labs having this open day. Yeah. Yes. And I want to thank you, Go uh, Dr. Gopi, and it's very uh, interesting and invigorating talk. I, I'm sure that most of the participants enjoy your talk. Uh, so. Uh, that's, I think we got more questions. I think we don't have time. And the next speaker is waiting here. Uh, okay. Thank you again. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Madhika, for inviting me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Manasa, can we uh, move on to the next speaker? Yes, sir. The second session's topic is material extrusion, 3D printing, and of metals and ceramics, for which I am prof 